the gateless gate. The smoke from the fires of war was thick not only on Mount High but was rising, as if from the leaping flames of a prairie fire, from the western districts of Mikawa, to the villages on the Tenri River, as far as the borders of Mino. The troops of Takeda Shinger had crossed the mountains of Kai and were flowing southward. The Tokugawa, who had dubbed their enemy, the long-legged Shinjen, vowed to stop his march on the capital. This was not for the sake of their Oda allies. Kai was critically close to the provinces of Mikawa and Tatami, and if the Takeda forces were to breel through, it would mean the annihilation of the Tokugawa clan. Ayasu was thirty-one years old and in the prime of manhood. His retainers had suffered every privation and hardship for the past twenty years. But at last Ayasu had come of age, his clan was on friendly terms with the Oda, and bit by bit he was encroaching on the territory of the Amagawa clan. His province was filled with the hope of prosperity and the courage of expansion, so much so that the elder retainers, the samurai, the farmers, and the townspeople seemed to be aroused and inspired. Mikawa could hardly match Kai in armaments and resources. In determination, however, it was not the least bit inferior. There was a reason why the Tokugawa warriors had given Shinjen the nickname, Long-Legged. This witticism had once been included in letter to Ayasu from Nobunaga, and when Ayasu read it, he thought it was worth relating to his retainers. The appellation was a clever one, for if only yesterday Shinjen had been fighting at the northern border of Kai against the Yusuji clan, today he was in Kozuk and Sagami and was threatening the Hojo clan. Or, turning quickly, he would release the fires of war in Mikawa or Mino. Moreover, Shinjen himself was always in the field giving directions. Thus people said he must have had mannequins to take his place, but the fact was that whenever his men fought, he did not seem to be satisfied unless he was there on the battlefield himself. But if Shinjen was long-legged, it could be said that Nabunaga was fleet-footed. Nabunaga had written to Ayasu, it would be better not to face the full force of the Kai attack right now. Even if the situation becomes pressing and you have to withdraw from Hamamatsu to Okazaki, I hope you will persevere. If our time must wait for another day, I doubt it will be long in coming. Nabunaga had sent this message to Ayasu before burning Mount High, but Ayasu had turned to his senior retainers and declared, right in front of the Oda messenger, Before abandoning Hamamatsu Castle, it would be better to break our bows and leave the samurai class. To Nabunaga, Ayasu's province was one of his lines of defense, but to Ayasu, Mikawa was his home. Ayasu was going to bury his bones in no other province but this one. When he received the messenger's reply, Nabunaga mumbled something about the man being too impatient, and returned to Gifu just as soon as he had finished with Mount Hai. Shinjen must have had something to say about that speed as well. As might be expected, he too was alert and looking for his opportunity. Shinjen had stated clearly that to be one day late could mean disasters for an entire year and now he felt the need to hurry all the more to fulfill his long-cherished desire of entering the capital. For this reason, all of his diplomatic moves were expedited. His friendship with the Hojo clan, therefore, was now brought to fruition, but his negotiations with the Yusuji clan were as unsatisfactory as before. Thus he was obliged to wait until the tenth month to leave Kai. Snow would soon close off his borders with Ekigo so his concern about Yusuji Kenshin would be alleviated. His army of about 30,000 men comprised troops conscripted from his domain, which included Kai, Shinano, Suruga, the northern part of Tatami, eastern Mikawa, western Kozuk, a part of Hida, and the southern part of Echa land holdings amounting to almost 1,300,000 bushels in all. The best thing we could do is put up a defense, one general argued at least until reinforcements come from Lord Nabunaga. One party of the men in Hamamatsu Castle spoke in favor of a defensive campaign. Even if all the province's samurai were mustered, the military strength of the Tokugawa clan was hardly 14,000 men barely half that of the Takeda army. Still, 
Ayasu chose to order a mobilization of his army. What? This is not a matter of waiting around for Lord Nabunaga's reinforcements. All of his retainers expected a great number of the Oda soldiers to come to their aid out of a natural sense of duty or even out of gratitude for the past service rendered by the Tokugawa clan at the Ain River. Ayasu, however, did his best to appear as though he had no expectation of reinforcements at all. Now was exactly the time for him to determine whether his men were resigned to a life-and-death situation, and to make them realize they could rely on nothing but their own strength. If it's destruction to retreat and destruction to advance, shouldn't we strike out in an all-or-nothing effort, make our names as warriors, and die a glorious death? He asked calmly. While this man had known misery and hardships from the time of his youth, he had matured into an adult who did not make a fuss over trifles. Now, with this situation upon them, the castle of Hamamatsu was as full of fury as a boiling kettle, but while Ayasu sat there and advocated a violent confrontation more than anyone else, the tone of his voice hardly changed at all. For this reason there were those among his retainers who had misgivings about the difference between his words and their intent. But Ayasu hastened steadily to make preparations to depart for the battlefield, as he received the reports of his scouts. One by one, like teeth being plucked from a comb, reports of each defeat were coming in. Shinjen had attacked Tadami. By now, it was likely that the castles at Tadaki and Ida had had no other choice but to surrender. In the villages of Fukura, Kakagawa, and Kihara, there was no place that the Kai forces had not trampled underfoot. Worse, Ayasu's 3,000-man vanguard under Honda, Okubo, and Nato had been discovered by the Takeda forces in the neighborhood of the Tenryu River. The Tokugawa had been routed and forced to retreat to Hamamatsu. This report made everyone in the castle turn pale, but Ayasu continued his military preparations. He was especially careful to secure his lines of communication and had been taking care of the defense of that area until nearly the end of the tenth month. And to secure Futama Castle at the Tenryu River, he had sent reinforcements of troops, weapons, and supplies. The army left Hamamatsu Castle, advanced as far as Kanmashi Village on the bank of the Tenryu River, and found the camp of the Kai army, each position linked to Shinjin's headquarters like spokes around a hub. Ah, uh, just as you'd expect. Even Ayasu stood on the hill for a moment with his arms folded and let out a sigh of admiration. The banners in Shinjin's main camp were visible even at this distance. From closer up, one could make out the inscription. They were the words of the famous Sun Tzu, familiar to enemy and ally alike. Fast as the wind, quiet as a forest, ardent as fire, still as a mountain. Still as a mountain, neither Shinjin nor Ayasu made any move for several days. With the Tenryu River between the opposing camps, winter came in with the eleventh month. Asterisk two things there are surpassing Ayasu, Ayasu's horned helmet and Honda Haihakairo. One of the Takeda men had posted this lampoon on the hill of Haidokotazaka. Ayasu's men had been soundly defeated and routed there or at least that was the opinion of the Takeda ranks elated by their victory. But as the poem admitted, the Tokugawa had some fine men, and Honda Haihakairo's retreat had been admirable. Ayasu was certainly not unworthy as an enemy. But in this next battle the entire forces of the Takeda would be up against the entire forces of the Tokugawa. They would strike at one another in a battle that would decide the outcome of the war. Anticipation of the fight only heightened the spirits of the men of Kai. That was the kind of composure they had. Shinjen moved his main camp to Adaijima and had his son, Katsuyori, and Anayama Baisetsu move their forces against Futamata Castle, with strict orders not to delay. In response, Ayasu quickly sent reinforcements, saying, Futama Castle is an impotent line of defense. If the enemy captures it, they'll have an advantageous place from which to make their attack. Ayasu himself gave orders to his rear guard, but the ever-changing Takeda army quickly went through yet another transformation and began pressing in on all sides. 
It seemed that if he made a false move now, he would be cut off from his headquarters in Hamamatsu. Futamata Castle's water supply its weakest point was cut by the enemy. On one side the castle abutted the Tenryu River, and the water that sustained the lives of the soldiers inside had to be lifted into the castle with a bucket lowered from a tower. To put an end to this, the Takeda forces launched rafts from upstream and undermined the base of the tower. From that day on, the soldiers in the castle were afflicted by a lack of water, even though the river flowed right in front of their walls. On the evening of the 19th, the garrison surrendered. When Shinjen learned that the castle had capitulated, he gave new orders. Nabumori will occupy the castle. Sano, Toyota, and Iwata will maintain communications and get ready along the enemy's road of retreat. Like a go-master watching each move of the stones, Shinjen was cautious with his army's formation and advance. The 27,000 soldiers of Kai moved slowly but surely, like black clouds across the land, as the beat of the drums resounded up to heaven. After that, Shinjin's main force crossed Aidani Plain and started to move into eastern Mikawa. It was midday on the 21st, and the cold was sharp enough to slice off a man's nose and ears. A red dust rose in Maikutagahara, mocking the weak winter sun. There had been no rain for days. The air was parched. On to Aidani, came the order. It caused a divergence of opinion among Shinjin's generals. If we're going to Aidani, he must have decided to surround Hamamatsu Castle. Wouldn't that be a mistake? Some had misgivings because the Oda troops had been arriving at Hamamatsu, and no one knew for sure how many soldiers might be there now. Such was the secret intelligence that had been trickling in since the morning. No matter how much they pressed the enemy, his real situation could not be calculated. The reports were always the same. There was some truth to the rumors that were circulating in the villages along the road which probably contained a good many of the enemy's own false reports that a large Oda force was heading south to join Ayasu's troops at Hamamatsu. Shinjin's generals offered their opinions. If Nabunaga arrives with a great army acting as a rear guard for Hamamatsu, you should probably give the matter careful thought right here, my lord. If the attack on Hamamatsu Castle takes us into the new year, our men will have to winter in the field. With constant surprise attacks from the enemy, our supplies will run out and the troops will fall victim to disease. In any case, the men will suffer. On the other hand, I fear that they may cut off our retreat along the coast and elsewhere. When reinforcements are added to the Oda rear guard, our men will be trapped on a narrow strip of enemy territory, a situation that will not easily be reversed. If this happens, your lordship's dream of marching into Kyoto will be frustrated, and we will have to open up a bloody path to retreat. Since we're mobilized at this point, why not go on with your foremost objective and march on the capital instead of attacking Hamamatsu Castle? Shinjin sat on a camp stool in the middle of his generals, his eyes narrow slits like needles. He nodded at each of their opinions, then said deliberately, All your opinions are extremely reasonable. But I am certain that the Oda reinforcements will amount to no more than a small force of three or four thousand men. If the greater part of the Oda army was to turn toward Hamamatsu, the Ase and Asakura, whom I have already contacted, would strike Nabunaga from the rear. Furthermore, the shogun in Kyoto would send messages to the warrior monks and their allies, urging them on. The Oda are not a major worry for us. He stopped for a moment, and then went on calmly. Entering Kyoto has been my fervent desire from the very beginning. But if we just bypassed Ayasu now, when we got to Gifu, Ayasu would come to the aid of the Oda by obstructing our rear. Isn't the best policy to smash Ayasu at Hamamatsu Castle, before the Oda can send him sufficient reinforcements? There was nothing the generals could do but accept his decision, not just because he was their lord but because they had faith in him as a superior tactician. As they returned to their regiments, however, there was one among them, Yamagata Masekage, who thought as he looked up at the cold, pale winter sun, this man lives for war, and he has an uncommon genius as a general. But this time, 
It was the night of the 21st when the report of the sudden change in Directayan of the Kai army arrived at Hamamatsu Castle. Just 3,000 men under Takigawa Kazumasu and Sakuma Nabumori had arrived at the castle as reinforcements from Nabunaga. A miserably small number, a Tokugawa retainer said, disappointed, but Ayasu displayed neither joy nor dissatisfaction. And as the reports came in one after another, a war council began, at which many of the castle's generals and the Oda commanders prudently recommended a temporary retreat to Okazaki. Ayasu alone did not move from his former position of holding out for battle. Are we going to retreat and not let one arrow fly in reprisal while the enemy insults my province? There was an elevated plain north of Hamamatsu, more than two leagues in breadth and three leagues in length Maikadagahara. In the early dawn of the 22nd, Ayasu's army left Hamamatsu and took a position north of an escarpment. There they waited for the approach of the Takeda forces. The sun rose, then the sky clouded over. The silhouette of a single bird peacefully crossed the wide sky above the dry, wilted plain. From time to time the scouts of both armies, looking like the shadows of birds, crawled through the dry grass and then hurried back to their lines. That morning Shinjin's army, which had previously camped on the plain, crossed the Tenryu River, continued marching, and arrived at Saigadani a little after noon. An order went out to the entire army to halt. The Mata Nobushuj and the other generals collected at Shinjin's side to ascertain the positions of the enemy that would soon be directly in front of them. After a momentary deliberation, Shinjin ordered one company to be left behind as a rear guard, while the main army continued as planned across the plain of Maikadagahara. Nearby was the village of Iwabi. The vanguard of the army had already entered the village. The men at the head of this serpentine procession of well over twenty thousand men could not see the men at the rear of it, even if they stood in their stirrups. Shinjin turned and said to the retainers around him, Something's going on at the rear. The men stared hard, trying to pierce the yellow dust rising in the distance. It seemed that the rear guard was under enemy attack. They must have been surrounded. They're only two or three thousand. If they're surrounded, they'll be wiped out. The horses had lowered their heads and were moving off at a clatter, but the generalists all sympathized with the men beneath the dust. Grasping their reins, they watched together uneasily. Shinjen was silent, speaking to no one. Though it was what they had expected, their men were being struck down and falling one after another in the far off cloud of dust, even as they looked on. Some surely had a son, a father, or a brother in the rear guard. And not just among the retainers and generals that had gathered around Shinjin. The whole army right down to the foot soldiers now looked to the side as they marched. Riding up along the column, Amada Nobushij galloped to Shinjin's side. Nobushij's voice was unusually excited and could clearly be heard by those nearby as he spoke from horseback. My lord! We'll never have an opportunity like this again to massacre ten thousand of the enemy. I've just come from reconnoitering the enemy formation attacking our rear guard. Each company is spread out in a storkwing formation. At a glance, it looks like a huge army, but the second and third ranks have no depth at all, and Ayasu's center is protected by a small force hardly amounting to anything. Not only that, but the companies are in extreme disorder and it's clear that the Oda reinforcements have no will to fight. If you'll take this opportunity and attack, my lord, you are bound to win. As Nobushij blurted this out, Shinjin looked back and then ordered some scouts to verify Nobushij's report. Hearing the tone of Shinjin's voice, Nobushij reined in his horse a little and held himself in check. The two scouts galloped away. It was known that the enemy force was much smaller than their own and Nobushij respected Shinjin's refusal to make unconsidered movements, but he himself had the impatience of an unruly horse stamping at the ground, and he was almost unable to restrain himself. A military opportunity can disappear in the instant it takes lightning to strike. The two scouts returned at a gallop and made their report. 
Amada Nobushid's observations and our own reconnaissance are in complete agreement. This is an opportunity sent by heaven. Shinjin's voice boomed out. The white mane of his helmet shook back and forth as he gave out commands to the generals on his right and left. The conch rang out. When the twenty thousand men heard its sound, as it reverberated from the vanguard to the rear of the army, the marching line broke up with the pounding of the earth. And just as it appeared to be breaking up completely, it reformed into a fish-scale formation and marched toward the Tokugawa army to the beating of drums. Ayasu was overawed when he saw the speed with which Shinjin's army was moving and how it responded to his every command. He said, If I ever reach Shinjin's age, just once I'd like to be able to move a large army as skillfully as he does. Having seen his style of command, I wouldn't want him killed, even if someone offered to poison him right now. Shinjin's ability to command impressed even the generals of the enemy to that extent. Battles were his art. His brave generals and intrepid warriors decorated their horses, armor, and banners to achieve a more glorious passage to the next world. It was almost as though tens of thousands of hawks had been released at once from Shinjin's fist. In a single breath, they dashed close enough to see the enemy's faces. The Tokugawa turned like a huge wheel, holding their storkwing formation, and faced the enemy like a human dam. The dust raised by the two armies darkened the sky. Only the spears shining in the setting sun glittered in the darkness. The spear core of Kai and that of Mikawa had advanced to the front and now stood facing each other. When either side raised a war cry the other side answered almost as an echo. When the clouds of dust began to settle, the two sides could clearly see each other, but the distance that separated them was still considerable. No one would take a step out from the twin lines of spears. At a time like this, even the bravest warriors shook with fear. One could say they were scared, but this was completely different from ordinary fear. It was not that their wills were shaken. When they trembled, it was because they were making the change from everyday life to the life of battle. This took only seconds, but in that instant a man's skin turned to goose flesh as purple as a rooster's comb. For a province at war, the life of a soldier was no different from that of the farmer carrying the hoe or the weaver at his loom. Each was equally valuable, and if the province should fall, all would perish with it. Those who nevertheless ignored the rise and fall of their province, and led lives of sloth were just like the dirt that clings to the human body of less value than a single eyelash. All of that aside, it was said that the instant of meeting the enemy face to face was terrifying. Heaven and earth were dark even at noon. You could not see what was right before your eyes, you could not go forward or retreat, and you were only jostled and shoved around on a line of readied spearheads. And the man who was brave enough to step out from this line before all the others was granted the title of the first spear. The man who became the first spear won glory in front of the thousands of warriors of both armies. That first step, however, was not so easily taken. Then one man stepped forward. Kato Kuroji of the Tokugawa clan is the first spear, a samurai shouted out. Kato's armor was plain and his name unknown. He was most likely a common samurai of the Tugawa clan. A second man dashed from the Tokugawa ranks. Kuroji's younger brother, Genjiro, is the second spear. The older brother was swallowed by the enemy and disappeared into the confusion. I'm the second spear. I'm Kato Kuroji's younger brother. Take a good look, you Takeda insects. Genjiro brandished his spear at the mass of warriors four or five times. A Kai soldier, turning to meet him, yelled an insult and leaped forward to strike. Genjiro fell backward, but grabbed the spear that had slipped across the breastplate of his armor and jumped to his feet with a curse. By that time his comrades had pushed their way through, but the Takeda had also turned and now came charging toward them. The scene was like billowing waves of blood, spears, and armor crashing into one other. Trampled by his own comrades and the horse's hooves, Genjiro screamed for his brother. 
Crawling on his hands and knees, however, he grabbed a Kai soldier by the foot and brought him down. He immediately cut off man's head and threw it away. After that, no one saw him again. The battle erupted in total confusion. But the clash between the right wing of the Tokugawa and the left wing of the Takeda had not reached this pitch of violence. The lines were spread out over a wide area. The droning of the drums and the sound of the conch shells rang within the dust clouds. Somehow, Shinjin's retainers seemed to be situated to the rear. Neither army had the time to send their gunners to the front, so the Takeda sent a Mizuma lightly armored samurai armed with stone slings to the front line. The stones they shot fell like rain. Facing them were the forces of Sakai Tadatsugu, and behind them the reinforcements from the Oda clan. Tadatsugu was on horseback, clicking his tongue in annoyance. The stones raining down on them from the front line of the Kai army were hitting his horse and making it go wild. And not only his horse. The horses of the mounted men who were waiting for their chance behind the spearmen reared and became so panicked they broke formation. The spearmen waited for orders from Tadatsugu, who had been holding them back with hoarse cries. Not yet! Wait until I give the word. The slingers on the front line of the enemy had played the part of army sappers open ING up an avenue of attack for the main force. Therefore, although the Mizumata Corps was not particularly fearsome, the hand-picked troops behind them were waiting for their chance. Here were the banners of the Yamagata, Nato, and Uamata Corps, famed for their valor even within the Kai army. It looks as though they're trying to provoke us by sending in the Mizumata. Tadatsuga thought. He could see through the enemy's strategy, but the left wing of the Tokugawa troops was already engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so the second line of the Oda was on its own. Furthermore, he couldn't be sure how Ayasu was viewing this from his position in the center. Charge! Tadatsugi yelled, opening his mouth almost wide enough to snap the cords of his helmet. He knew full well that he was falling into the enemy's trap, but he had been unable to gain the advantage since the beginning of the battle. The defeat of the Tokugawa and their allies began here. The shower of rocks suddenly stopped. At the same moment the seven or eight hundred Nazumata broke off to the right and left and abruptly fell back. We're done for! Tadatsugi yelled. By the time he had seen the second line of the enemy, it was already too late. Lying concealed between the slingers and the cavalry was yet another line of men, the gunners. Each man was lying on his stomach in the tall grass, his gun at the ready. There was a staccato clatter of musket fire as all the guns went off in a single volley, and a cloud of smoke rose from the grass. Because the angle of fire was low, many of the charging men of the Sakai Corps were hit in the legs. The startled horses reared and were hit in the belly. Officers leaped from the saddle before their horses fell, and ran with their men, stepping over the corpses of their comrades. Fall back, the commander of the Takeda gunners ordered. The gunners immediately withdrew. To stay where they were would have meant being overrun by the charging Oda spearmen. With the muzzles of their horses in line, the Yamagata Corps, the Flower of Kai, galloped out with composure and dignity, followed immediately by the Obata Corps. In minutes they had annihilated Sakai Tadatsuga's line. Victory cries were raised proudly from the Kai army, when just as suddenly the Uamata Corps took a roundabout route and advanced on the flank of the Oda Force's second line of the Tokugawa defense their horses raising the dust as they came. In the twinkling of an eye the Tokugawa were surrounded by the huge Kai army, as though by an iron wheel. Ayasu stood on a knoll and looked over at the lines of his men. We've lost, he said to himself. It was inevitable. Gazing fixedly ahead, Tori Tadahiro, the ranking general of the Tokugawa under Ayasu, had warned his lord not to advance, but rather to send out incendiary raids where the enemy would be bivouacking that night. But Shinjen, ever the crafty enemy, had purposefully thrown out the bait with the small rear guard and encouraged Ayasu's attack. We can't just sit here. You must retreat to Hamamatsu, Tadahiro urged. The faster you withdraw, the better. Ayasu said nothing. 
My lord! My lord! Tadahiro pleaded. Ayasu was not looking at Tadahiro's face. As the sun set the white evening mist and the darkness were gradually becoming deeply divided at the edge of Maikutagahara. Riding the wintry wind, the banners of the messengers repeatedly brought in the sad news. Sakuma Nabumori of the Oda clan was crushed. Takigawa Kazumasa fell back in disorder, and Hirate Nagamasa was killed. Only Sakai Tadatsugu stands fast in hard fighting. Takeda Katsuyori combined his strength with the Yamagata Corps and surrounded our left wing. Ishikawa Kazumasa was wounded, and Nakani Masataru and Aoki Hiratsugu are both dead. Matsudaira Yasuzumi galloped into the midst of the enemy and was cut down. The forces of Honda Tadamesa and Naruz Masayoshi aimed for Shinjin's retainers and cut deeply into the enemy, but they were completely surrounded by several thousand men, and not one returned alive. Suddenly, Tadahiro grabbed Ayasu's arm and, with the help of other generals, pushed him up onto his horse. Get out of here! He yelled at the horse, slapping it on the rump. When Ayasu was in the saddle and his horse was galloping away, Tadahiro and the other retainers mounted and went after him. Snow began to fall. Perhaps it had been waiting for the sun to set. As the wind blew the snow thick and fast, it swept around the banners, men, and horses of the defeated army, making their way even less sure. The men shouted out in confusion, His lordship! Where is his lordship? Which way to headquarters? Where is my regiment? The Kai gunners took aim at the fleeing men lost by the roadside, and fired volleys at them from the midst of the swirling snow. Retreat! A Tokugawa soldier shouted. The conch shell is sounding a withdrawal. They must already have evacuated the headquarters. Another rejoined. A tidal wave of defeated men swept along in a black line toward the north, lost its way toward the west, and suffered many more casualties. Finally the men began to stampede in one direction, toward the south. Ayasu, who had just escaped from danger with Tori Tadahiro, looked back at the men following along behind, and suddenly stopped his horse. Raise the banners. Raise the banners and assemble the men, he commanded. Night was approaching fast, and the snow was steadily increasing. Ayasu's retainers gathered around him and sounded the conch shell. Waving the commander's standards, they called the men in. Gradually the men of the defeated army gathered around them. Every man was soaked in blood. The corps of Baba Nabifusa and Obata Kazusa of the Kai army, however, knew that the main body of enemy troops was there, and very quickly began pressing in on them with bows and arrows from one side and guns from the other. It appeared that they would try to cut off their retreat. It's dangerous here, my lord. You'd better retreat as quickly as possible. Mizuno Sakan urged Ayasu. Then, turning to the men, he announced, Protect his lordship. I am going to take a few men and attack the enemy. Anyone who wants to sacrifice his life for his lordship, follow me. Sakan galloped straight for the enemy line, without a look back to see whether anyone was following him. Thirty or forty soldiers followed after him, riding to certain death. Almost immediately, wailing, shouting, and the clash of swords and spears mingled with the moaning of the wind-borne snow and blurred into a vortex. Sakan must not die, Ayasu shouted. He was not his normal self at all. His retainers tried to stop him by grabbing the bridle of his horse, but he threw them off, and by the time they got up, he was already riding fast into the black and white vortex, looking exactly like a demon. My lord! My lord! they yelled. When Natsum Jurizaman, the officer left in charge of Hamamatsu Castle, heard of the defeat of his comrades, he set out with a small force of thirty mounted men to ensure the safety of Ayasu. Arriving at this point and finding his lord in the midst of a desperate fight, he jumped off his horse and ran toward the melee, shifting his spear to his left hand. Wa well, what is this? This violence is not like you, my lord. Go back to Hamamatsu. Withdraw, my lord. 
Grasping the horse's muzzle, he pulled it around with difficulty. Jerizamon? Let me go. Are you fool enough to get in my way in the middle of the enemy? If I'm a fool, my lord, you're an even bigger one. If you're cut down in a place like this, what good will all of our hardships have been until now? You'll be remembered as a fool of a general. If you want to distinguish yourself, then do something important for the nation on another day. With tears in his eyes, Jerizamon yelled at Ayasu so loudly that his mouth almost split to his ears, and at the same time he beat Ayasu's horse unmercifully with his spear. Of the retainers and close attendants who had been with Ayasu the night before, there were many whose faces were no longer seen this evening. More than three hundred of Ayasu's men had died in battle, and no one knew how many had been wounded. Bearing the onus of belonging to a disastrously defeated army, the men filed back to the snow-covered castle town, looking as though they were disgusted with themselves. The retreat went on from evening until after midnight. The sky had turned red, perhaps because there were bonfires at each of the castle gates. But the red color of the fallen snow was clearly from the blood of the returning warriors. What happened to his lordship? The men asked in tears. They had retreated think ing that Ayasu had already returned to the castle, and were now told by the guards that he had not yet returned. Was he still surrounded by the enemy, or had he been killed? Whichever it was, they had fled before their lord, and they were so ashamed that they refused to enter the castle. They simply stood outside, stamping their feet in the cold. Adding to the confusion, gunfire was suddenly heard from beyond the western gate. It was the enemy. Death was pressing in on them. And if the Takeda had already come this far, Ayasu's fate was truly in doubt. Thinking that the end had come for the Tokugawa clan, they ran with a shout toward the sound of the guns, prepared to die in battle, their eyes devoid of any hope. As a group of them jostled through the gate, they nearly collided with several mounted men galloping in. Beyond all expectation, the riders were their own commanders returning from battle, and the soldiers turned their pathetic cries into shouts of welcome, waving their swords and spears and leading the men inside. One rider, then another, and then yet another galloped in. The eighth was Ayasu, one sleeve of his armor torn, and his body covered with blood and snow. It's Lord Ayasu! Lord Ayasu! As soon as they saw him, the word went from mouth to mouth, and the men leaped in the air, completely forgetting themselves. Striding into the keep, Ayasu yelled out in a loud voice, Hizano! Hizano! As if he were still on the battlefield. The lady-in-waiting hurried toward him and prostrated herself. The flame on the small lamp she carried guttered in the wind, casting flickering light on Ayasu's profile. There was blood on his cheek and his hair was in appalling disarray. Bring a comb, he said, sitting down heavily. While Hizano arranged his hair, he gave her another order. I'm hungry. Bring me something to eat. When the food was brought in, he immediately picked up his chopsticks, but instead of eating he said, Open up all the doors to the veranda. Even with the lamps flickering, the room was brighter when the doors were wide open because of the snow outside. Dark groups of warriors were resting on the veranda. As soon as Ayasu had finished his meal, he left the keep and went around checking the castle's defenses. He ordered Amano Yasukage and Uemura Masakatsu to guard against an attack, and positioned the other commanders all the way from the main gate to the main entrance of the keep. Even if the entire Kai army attacks with all its strength, we're going to show them our own force of arms. They're not going to take possession of even one inch of these stone walls. They boasted. Even if their voices were strained, their aim was to put Ayasu at ease and to give him encouragement. Ayasu understood their intentions and nodded vigorously, but just as they were ready to run off to their posts, he called them back. Don't close any of the castle gates from the main gate to the keep. Leave them all open. Do you understand? What? What are you saying, my lord? The commanders were hesitant. This order conflicted with the basic tenets of defense. 
The iron doors of all the gates had been shut. The enemy army was already closing in on the castle town, as it bore down to destroy them. Why would he order them to open the floodgates of the dike, just when a tidal wave was at hand? Tadahiro said. No, I don't think the situation warrants going that far. When our retreating troops arrive, we can open the gates and let them in. Certainly we don't need to leave the castle gates wide open for them. Ayasa laughed and admonished him for misunderstanding. This is not for the men who are returning late. It's in preparation for the Takeda who are coming in like an arrogant tide, sure of their victory. And I don't just want the castle gates opened. I want five or six large bonfires lit in front of the entrance. You should also build some bonfires inside the castle walls. But make sure the defense is strictly in order. Be very quiet and watch for the enemy's approach. What sort of fearless counter-strategy was this? But without the slightest hesitation, they did as he ordered. According to Ayasa's wishes, the castle gates were opened wide, and blazing bonfires cast their reflections in the snow from beyond the moat to the entrance of the keep. After gazing at the scene for a moment, Ayasu once again went inside. It appeared that the senior generals understood, but the soldiers in the castle for the most part seemed to believe the rumor spread by Ayasu's own officer that Shinjen was dead, and that the advancing enemy had lost its foremost general. I'm tired, Hizano. I think I'll have a cup of sake. Pour one for me, please. Ayasu returned to the main hall and, after draining a cup, lay down. He pulled up the bedding that Hizano had put over him and then went to sleep with a snore. Not much later, the troops of Baba Nabifusa and Yamagata Masakage poured in near the moat, in readiness for a night attack. What's this? Wait. When Baba and Yamagata drew up in front of the castle gate, they reined in their horses and stopped the entire army from running hastily ahead. General Baba, what do you think? Yamagata asked, drawing his horse up next to his colleague. He seemed to be totally puzzled. Baba had his doubts as well and looked out toward the enemy's gate. There, burning in the distance, were the bonfires, both before and within the castle gate. And the iron doors were wide open. It was gateless, and yet there was a gate. The situation seemed to pose a disturbing question. The water in the moat was black, the snow on the fully manned castle was white. Not a sound could be heard. If the men listened very carefully, they could hear the crackling sound of the firewood in the distance. And if they had concentrated both mind and ears, they might have heard the snores of Ayasu, the defeated general, as he dreamed the very heart of this gateless gate inside the keep. Yamagata said, I think our pursuit was so fast and the enemy has become so confused that they've had no time to close the castle gate and are lying low. We should attack at once. No, wait. Baba interrupted. He had a reputation as one of the cleverest tacticians in Shinjin's army. A wise man who cultivates wisdom may sometimes drown in it. He explained to Yamagata why his plan was wrong. To have secured the castle gates would have been the natural psychology of defeat in this case. But leaving the castle wide open and taking the time to build bonfires is proof of the man's fearlessness and composure. If you think about it, he's undoubtedly waiting for us to attack rashly. He's concentrating on this one castle and is fully confident of his victory. Our opponent is a young general, but he is Tokugawa Ayasu. We shouldn't step carelessly, only to bring shame on the martial reputation of the Takeda and be laughed later. They had pressed that far, but in the end, both generals pulled their men back. Inside, when Ayasu heard his attendant's voice penetrating his sleep, he leaped up with a start. I'm not dead, he shouted, and jumped for joy. He immediately sent troops in pursuit. As might be expected of them, Yamagata and Baba did not lose their heads in the confusion, but rather threw up a resistance, set fires in the neighborhood of Naguri, and executed several brilliant maneuvers. The Tokugawa had suffered a grave defeat, but it might be said that they had shown their mettle. Not only that, 
but they had once again caused Xinjiang to abandon his march to the capital and left him with no other choice than to withdraw to Kai. Many men had been sacrificed. Compared with the four hundred men of the Takeda, the dead and wounded on the Tokugawa side numbered as many as eleven hundred eighty. Funeral for the Living Red and white petals fluttered down from Gifu Castle on its high mountain peak and fell on the roofs in the town below. Year by year, the people's confidence in Nobunaga increased a confidence that grew from the security of their lives. The laws were strict, but Nobunaga's words were not empty. The things he promised concerning the people's livelihood were always put into effect, and this was reflected in their wealth. To think that a man has but fifty years to live under heaven. Surely this world seems but a vain dream. The people of the province knew the verses Nobunaga loved to chant when he drank. But he understood these words quite differently from the way the monks did that the world was nothing more than a fleeting and impermanent dream. Is there anything that will not decay? was his favorite line, and every time he sang it, he raised the pitch of his voice. His view of life seemed to be contained in this one line. A man would not make the most of his life if he did not think deeply about it. Nobunaga knew this about life, in the end, we die. For a man of thirty-seven, the future would not be a long one. And for such a short time, his ambition was extraordinarily large. His ideals were limitless, and facing these ideals and overcoming the obstacles fulfilled him completely. Man, however, has an allotted span of life, and he could not help his feelings of regret. Ranmaru, beat the drum. He was going to dance today again. Earlier that day, he had entertained a messenger from I.C. He continued to drink through the afternoon. Ramru brought the drum from the next room. Instead of playing it, however, he delivered a message. Lord Hideyoshi has just arrived. At one time it had seemed that the Ase and Asakura were going to make their move after Maikatagahara, as they had begun to wriggle and squirm repeatedly. But after Xinjiang had retreated, they cowered inside their own provinces and began to strengthen the defenses. Anticipating peace, Hideyoshi had secretly left Yokoyama Castle and turned the area around the capital. None of the castle commanders anywhere, regardless of how chaotic the conditions of the country, remained locked up in their castles. Sometimes they would pretend to be gone but would really be there. At other times they would pretend to be there but would really be gone for the way of a soldier lay in properly using the forms of truth and falsehood. Of course, Hideyoshi had also traveled incognito on this trip, and quite likely that was also the reason he had arrived so suddenly at Gifu. Hideyoshi? Nobunaga had him wait in another room, and soon came in and sat down. He was in an extraordinarily good mood. Hideyoshi was dressed with extreme simplicity, looking no different from an ordinary traveler. In this attire he prostrated himself, but then looked up and laughed. I'll bet you're surprised. Nobunaga looked as though he didn't understand. About what? he asked. My sudden arrival. What kind of foolishness is this? I've known you were not in Yokoyama for the last two weeks. But you probably didn't expect me to show up here today. Nobunaga laughed. You think I'm blind, don't you? You probably got tired of playing around with the prostitutes in the capital, came down the Omi Road as far as some man's house in Nagahama, secretly called Oyu, and came here after a rendezvous. Hideyoshi mumbled a reply. You're the one who's probably surprised, Nabunaga said. I am surprised, my lord. You see everything. This mountain is high enough for me to look out over ten provinces at least. But there's someone who knows your behavior in even more detail than I do. Do you have any idea who that is? You must have a spy trailing me. Your wife. You're joking. Aren't you a little intoxicated today, my lord? I may be drunk, but I'm hardly mistaken about what I'm saying. Your wife may be living at Sonomata, but if you think she's far away, you're making a serious mistake. Oh, no. Well, I've come at a bad time. With your permission, I, you can't be blamed for playing around. 
Nabunaga said, laughing. There's nothing wrong with looking at the cherry blossoms from time to time. But why don't you call Nene, and the two of you get together? Of course. It's been a while since you've seen her, hasn't it? Has my wife been bothering you with letters or the like? Don't worry. There hasn't been anything like that, but I sympathize. And not just with your wife. Every wife has to look after the home while her husband is away at war. So even if he has only a little bit of time, a man should show his wife before anyone else that he's all right. As you wish, but... Do you refuse? I do. There's been nothing untoward for a number of months, but my state of mind has not moved away from the battlefield by even a hair's breadth. Always the clever talker. Are you going to start wagging that tongue again? It's quite unnecessary. I'll retire, my lord. I'm rolling up my banners here. Lord and Retainer laughed together. After a while they started drinking and even sent Ranmer away. Then the talk turned to a topic serious enough for them to lower their voices. Nabunaga asked expectantly, So how are things in the capital? I have messengers constantly going back and forth, but I want to hear what you have seen. What Hideyoshi was about to say seemed to have to do with his expectations. Our seats are a little far apart. Either my lord or I should move a little closer for this. I'll move. Nabunaga took the sake flask and his cup and moved down from the seat of honor. Close the sliding doors to the next room too, he ordered. Hideyoshi sat down directly in front of Nabunaga and said, The conditions are the same as ever. Except that, since Shinjen failed to reach the capital, the shogun seems to have become more despondent. His schemes have become openly hostile to you, my lord. Well, I can imagine. After all, Shinjen got as far as Maikitagahara, and then the shogun heard that he had withdrawn. Shogun Yoshiaki is a crafty politician. He fidgets about, bestowing favors on the people, and indirectly makes them fear you. He's made good propaganda out of the burning of Mount Hai and seems to be inciting other religious groups to rebellion. Not a pleasant set of circumstances. But it's not worth worrying about. The warrior monks have seen what happened to Mount Hai, and it has cooled their courage considerably. Hosokawa is in the capital. Did you see him? Lord Hosokawa has fallen out of favor with the shogun and has confined himself to his country estate. He was driven away by Yoshiaki? Nabunaga asked. It seems that Lord Hosokawa thought that allying with you would be the best way to preserve the shogunate. He risked his own reputation and advised Lord Yoshiaki several times. It's apparent that Yoshiaki won't listen to anyone. More than that, he's taking a rather extravagant view of the remaining powers of the shogunate. In a period of transition, a cataclysm separates past and future. Almost all of those who perish are those who, because of their blind attachment to the past, fail to realize that the world has changed. Are we living through such a cataclysm? In fact, a very dramatic event has just occurred. Word was just sent to me, but what kind of dramatic event? Well, this has still not leaked out to the world, but since it was heard by the keen ears of my agent Watanabe Tenzo, I think that it can perhaps be believed. What is it? It's incredible, but the guiding star of Kai may have finally set. What? Shinjen? During the second month, he attacked Mikawa, and one night while he was laying siege to Noda Castle, he was shot. This is what Tenzo heard. For a moment, Nabunaga's eyes widened and he looked straight at Hideyoshi's face. If it was true that Shinjen was dead, the course of the nation was going to change very quickly. Nabunaga felt as though the tiger at his back had suddenly disappeared, and he was shocked. He wanted to believe this story, but at the same time he could not. As soon as heard the news, he felt an incredible surge of relief, and an indescribable joy welled up inside of him. If this is true, a very gifted general has left this world, Nabunaga said and from now on history has been entrusted into our hands. His expression was not nearly as complex as Hideyoshi's. 
In fact, he looked as though he had just been served the main course at a meal. He was shot, but I still have no idea whether he died immediately, what were the extent of his wounds, or where he was hit. But I've heard that when they suddenly lifted the siege of Noda Castle and withdrew into Kai, they did not display the usual Takeda fighting spirit. I suspect not. But it doesn't matter how fierce the Kai samurai are, if they have lost Jinjin. I received this report secretly from Tenzo on my way here, so I immediately sent him back to Kai to get confirmation. Has no one heard this yet in the other provinces? There are no indications that anyone has. The Takeda clan will probably keep it a secret, and will make it appear that Xinjin is in good health. So if some policy is promulgated in Xinjin's name, the chances are 9 out of 10 that Xinjin is dead, or at least in a serious condition. Nabunaga nodded thoughtfully. He seemed to want to confirm this story. Suddenly he took the cup of cold sake and sighed. To think that a man has but fifty years. But he did not feel like dancing. Reflecting on another man's death moved him far more than reflecting on his own. When will Tenzo return? He should be back within three days. To Yokoyama Castle? No, I told him to come straight here. Well then, stay here until then. I had planned on doing that, but if I could, I'd like to wait for your orders at an inn in the castle town. Why? No particular reason. Well, how about staying in the castle? Keep me company for a while. Well? What a dullard! Do you feel constrained to be at my side? No, the truth is. The truth is what? I left a... Companion in that and in the castle town, and since I imagined it would be lonely there, I promised I would go back tonight. Is this companion a woman? Nabunaga was dumbfounded. The emotions that the report of Shinjin's death aroused in him were so far removed from Hideyoshi's worries. Go to the inn tonight, but come back to the castle tomorrow. You can bring your companion with you. These were Nabunaga's last words to him as he turned to go. He had hit the nail right on the head, Hideyoshi thought on his way back to the inn. He felt as though he had been reprimanded, but this was, again, Nabunaga's grace. He was wrapping the head of the nail in an artistic decoration without the nail, even not a kainji. The following day he went up to the castle with Oyu, but it did not cause him any embarrassment. Nabunaga had moved to a different room and, unlike the day before, was not surrounded by the smell of sake. Sitting in front of Hideyoshi and Oyu, he looked down at them from a dais. Aren't you Takanaka Hanbei's sister? he asked familiarly. This was the first time Oyu had met Nabunaga, and here she was with Hideyoshi. She hid her face and would have liked to have sunk through the floor, but she answered with a faint voice that was a thing of beauty. I am honored to make your acquaintance, my lord. You have also favored my other brother, Shigeru. Nabunaga gazed at her, impressed. He had felt like teasing Hideyoshi a little, but now he felt guilty and became serious. Has Hanbei's health improved? I haven't seen my brother for some time, my lord. He's busy with his military duties, but I do receive letters from time to time. Where are you living now? At Chotaikin Castle in Fuwa, where I have a slight connection. I wonder if Watanabe Tenzo has returned yet, Hideyoshi said, trying to change the subject. But Nabunaga was an old fox and was not going to be taken in. What are you saying? You're getting confused. Didn't you yourself just tell me that Tenzo wouldn't return for another three days? Hideyoshi's face turned bright red. Nabunaga seemed to be satisfied with this. He had wanted to see him look self-conscious and troubled for a while. Nabunaga invited Oya to the evening's drinking party and commented, You haven't seen my dancing, although Hideyoshi has seen it on several occasions. When Oya asked to take her leave later that evening, Nabunaga did not insist on her staying, but he said bluntly to Hideyoshi, Well then you go too. The couple left the castle. Soon, however, Hideyoshi returned alone somewhat flustered. Where is Lord Nabunaga? He asked the page. 
He has just now retired to his bedroom. Hearing this, Hideyoshi hurried to the private apartments with an unusual lack of composure and asked the samurai attendant to convey a message. I must have an audience with his lordship this evening. Nabunaga had not yet gone to sleep, and as soon as Hideyoshi was ushered into his presence, he asked for everyone to leave the room, but although the men on night watch withdrew, Hideyoshi still looked around the room nervously. What is it, Hideyoshi? Well, it seems there's still someone in the next room. It's no one to be worried about. It's just Ramaru. He should be no problem. He is also a problem. I'm sorry to ask, but... He should go too? Yes. Ramaru, you leave too. Nabunaga turned and spoke toward the next room. Ramaru bowed silently, got up, and left. It should be all right now. What is this? The fact is that when I took my leave and went back to town just now, I ran into Tenzo. What? Tenzo's back? He said that he hurried across the mountains to get here, hardly knowing day from night. Shinjin's death is a certainty. So, after all, I can't give you many details, but the inner circle in Kai seems to have put on a fod of normality, beneath which a melancholy air can clearly be detected. Their mourning is being kept a strict secret, I'll bet. Of course. And the other provinces know nothing? So far. So now's the time. I assume you forbade Tenzo to speak about this. That's not something you have to worry about. But there are some unscrupulous men among the ninja. Are you sure about him? He's Heikelman's nephew, and he is loyal. Well, we should be extremely cautious. Give him a reward, but keep him inside the castle. It would probably be better to imprison him until this is all over. No, my lord. Why not? Because if we treat a man like that, the next time the opportunity comes up, he won't feel. Like jeopardizing his life as he did this time. And if you cannot trust a man, but give him a reward, he might be tempted with a lot of money by the enemy someday. Well then, where did you leave him? As luck would have it, Oyu was just about to return to Fua, so I ordered him to go along as a guard for her palanquin. The man risked his life coming back from Kai, and you immediately ordered him to accompany your mistress? Isn't Tenzo going to resent that? He went along with her happily. I may be a foolish master, but he knows me very well. You seem to employ people a little differently than I do. You can be doubly at ease, my lord. She may be a woman, but if it appears that Tenzo is about to spill any secrets to anyone, she'll protect our interests, even if she has to kill him. Put away your self-congratulations. Sorry. You what I'm like. That's not the point, Nabunaga said. The Tiger of Kai has died, so we can't delay. We've got to move before Shinjin's death is known by the world at large. Hideyoshi, leave tonight and hurry back to Yokoyama. I had planned to do that immediately, so I sent Oya back to Fua and forget the rest. I've hardly got time to sleep. We're going to mobilize at daybreak. Nabunaga's thoughts were perfectly in line with Hideyoshi's. The opportunity they had always sought the time to finish up a former problem was now at hand. The problem being, of course, the liquidation of the troublesome shogun and the old order. Needless to say, as Nabunaga was an actor in the new age that was about to replace the old, his advance was quickly realized. On the twenty-second day of the third month, his army thundered out of Gifu. When it arrived at the shores of Lake Biwa, the army split into two. One half of the army was under the command of Nabunaga. He boarded ship and sailed across the lake to the west. The remaining half, composed of the troops led by Katsui, Mitsuhide, and Hachiya took the land route and advanced along the southern edge of the lake. The land army ousted the anti Nabunaga forces made up of the warrior monks in the area between Kateda and Ishiyama and destroyed the fortifications that had been erected along the road. The shogun's advisors quickly held a conference. Shall we resist? Shall we sue for peace? These men had a big problem, 
They had not yet given a clear answer to the 17-article document that Nobunaga had sent to Yoshiaki on New Year's Day. In it, Nobunaga had itemized all his grievances against Yoshiaki. What audacity! I am the shogun, after all! Yoshiaki had said angrily, conveniently forgetting that it was Nobunaga who had protected him and returned him to Nijo Palace. Why should I submit to a non-entity like Nobunaga? Messengers had come from Nobunaga one after another to work out peace terms, but had withdrawn without being granted audiences. Then, as a sort of response, the shogun had barricades erected on the roads that led to the capital. The opportunity that Nobunaga had been waiting for and that Hideyoshi had been planning against was the arrival of the appropriate moment for reproving Yoshiaki for his lack of response to the Seventeen Articles. That opportunity had come sooner than either of them had imagined hastened by Shinjin's death. In any period of history, a man on his way to ruin always holds on to the ludicrous illusion that he is not the one about to fall. Yoshiaki fell straight into that trap. Nobunaga saw him in yet another way, saying, We can use him, too. Thus he was handled with delicate disrespect. But the members of the worthless shogunate of this period did not know their own value, and no matter what the subject of their thoughts, intellectually speaking, their understanding did not go beyond the past. They saw only the narrow face of culture in the capital and believed that it prevailed throughout Japan. And trusting themselves to the cramped policies of the past, they relied on the warrior monks of the Hunganji and on the many samurai warlords throughout the provinces who hated Nobunaga. The shogun was still unaware of Shinjin's death. And so he played tough. I am the shogun, the pillar of the samurai class. I'm different from the monks on Mount Hai. If Nobunaga were to aim his weapons at Nijo Palace, he would be branded a traitor. His attitude indicated that he would not decline war if it was offered. Naturally, he called on the clans around the capital and sent urgent messages to the faraway Ase, the Asakura, the Yusuji and the Takeda, setting up a showy defense. When Nobunaga heard this, he turned toward the capital with a laugh and, without stopping his army for a single day, entered Osaka. The ones who were shocked this time were the warrior monks of the Hanganji. Suddenly face to face with Nobunaga's army, they had no idea what to do. But Nobunaga was content simply to line his men up in battle array. We can strike any time we like he said. At this point he wanted most strongly to avoid any unnecessary expenditure of military strength. And until this time, he had repeatedly sent envoys to Kyoto asking for a response to the Seventeen Articles. So this was a sort of ultimatum. Yoshiaki took a high-handed view. He was shogun and he simply did not feel like listening to Nobunaga's opinions of his administration. Among the seventeen articles, Yoshiaki was pressed quite firmly by two articles in particular. The first was concerned with the crime of disloyalty to the emperor. The second article had to do with his disgraceful conduct. While it was his duty to maintain the peace of the empire, he himself had incited the provinces to rebellion. It's useless. He'll never accept this kind of grilling just written notes and messengers. Araki Murishu said to Nobunaga. Hosokawa Fujitaka, who had also joined Nobunaga, added, I suppose it's no use hoping that the shogun will wake up before his fall. Nobunaga nodded. He seemed to understand only too well. But it would not be necessary to use the drastic violence here that he had employed at Mount Hai. Either was he so poor in strategy that he would have to use the same method twice. Back to Kyoto. Nobunaga had given this order on the fourth day of the fourth month, but it had seemed nothing more than an exercise to impress the masses with the size of his army. Look at that. He's not going to have them bivouac for very long. Just like the last time, Nobunaga's uneasy about Gifu and is hurriedly withdrawing his soldiers, Yoshiaki said elated. With the reports that came to him one after another, however, his color began to change. For just as he was congratulating himself about the troops bypassing Kyoto, the Oda army flowed into the capital from the Osaka road. Then, 
without a single war cry and more peacefully than if they had been simply performing maneuvers, the soldiers surrounded Yoshiaki's residence. We're close to the imperial palace, so be careful not to disturb his majesty. It will be enough to censure this impudent shogun's crimes, Nabinaga ordered. There was no gunfire, and not even the hum of a single bowstring. It was uncanny far. More than if there had been a great commotion. Yamato, what do you think we should do? What is Nabunaga going to do to me? Yoshiaki asked his senior advisor, Nabuchi Yamato. You're pitifully unprepared. At this point, do you still not understand what Nobunaga has in mind? He's clearly come to attack you. Be but. I'm the shogun. These are troubled times. What good is a title going to do you? It appears that you have only two choices, either resolve to fight or sue for peace. As his retainer spoke these words, tears fell from his eyes. Along with Hosokawa Fujitaka, this honorable man had not left Yoshiaki's side since the days of his exile. I do not remain to protect my honor or to seek fame, nor am I following a strategy for survival. I know what's going to happen tomorrow but somehow I just can't abandon this fool of a shogun. Yamato had once said. Certainly he knew that Yoshiaki was hardly worth saving. He knew the world was changing, but he seemed resolved to stand his ground at Nijo Palace. He was already over fifty years old, a general past his prime. Sue for peace? Is there any good reason why I, the shogun, should beg someone like Nabunaga for peace? You're so obsessed by the title of Shogun that your only course is self-destruction. Don't you think we'll win if we fight? There's no reason why we should. It would be completely laughable if you put up a defense of this place with any thought of victory. Well then, why are you and the other generals dressed up in your armor so ostentatiously? We think it would at least be a beautiful way to die. Even though the situation is hopeless, to make our final stand here will be a fitting end to fourteen generations of shoguns. That is the duty of a samurai, after all. It's really nothing more than arranging flowers at a funeral. Wait. Don't attack yet. Put down your guns. Yoshiaki disappeared into the palace and consulted with Hino and Takaka, two courtiers with whom he was on friendly terms. After noon, a messenger was secretly sent out of the palace by Hino. Following that, the governor of Kyoto came from the Oda's side and toward evening, Oda Nobuhiro appeared as a formal envoy from Nabunaga. Hereafter, I will carefully observe each of the articles, Yoshiaki assured the envoy. With a bitter look on his face, Yoshiaki pledged himself with words that were not in his heart. That day he begged for peace. Nabunaga's soldiers withdrew and peacefully returned to Gifu. Only one hundred days later, However, Nabunaga's army once again surrounded Nijo Palace. And that was because, of course, Yoshiaki had fallen back on his old tricks once again after the first piece. The great roof of the Myokaku Temple at Nijo was beaten desolately by the rains of the seventh month. The temple served as Nabunaga's headquarters. There had been a terrible wind and rain from the time his fleet had started across Lake Biwa but this had only increased the determination of the troops. Soaked by the rain and covered in mud, they had surrounded the shogun's palace and were poised, waiting only for the command to attack. No one knew if Yoshiaki was to be executed or taken prisoner, but his fate was entirely in their hands. Nabunaga's troops felt as though they were looking into the cage of a fierce, noble animal that they were about to slaughter. The voices of Nabunaga and Hideyoshi drifted on the wind. What are you going to do? Hideyoshi asked. At this point there are no two ways about it. Nabunaga was firm. I'm not forgiving him this time. But he's the don't belabor the obvious. Is there no margin for a little more deliberation? None. Absolutely not. The room in the temple was gloomy from the darkening rain outside. The combination of the lingering summer heat and the long autumn rains had resulted in such humid weather that even the gold leaf of the Buddhas and the monochrome ink drawings on the siding doors looked mildewed. 
I'm not criticizing you for being rash when I ask for a little more deliberation, Hideyoshi said. But the position of shogun is granted by the imperial court, so we cannot treat the matter lightly. And it will give the anti-Nabunaga forces an excuse to call for justice against the man who killed his rightful lord, the shogun. I suppose you're right, Nabunaga replied. Happily, Yoshiaki is so weak that though he is trapped, he'll either kill himself nor come out to fight. He's just going to lock up the gates of his palace and rely on the water in his moat to keep rising from all this rain. So, what is your plan? Nabunaga asked. We purposely open one part of our encirclement and provide a way for the shogun to escape. Won't he become a nuisance in the future? He might be used to strengthen the ambitions of some other province. No, Hideyoshi said. I think that people have gradually become disgusted with Yoshiaki's character. I suspect that they would understand even if Yoshiaki were driven from the capital, and they would be satisfied that your punishment was fitting. That evening the besieging army created an opening and made an obvious display of a shortage of soldiers. Inside the palace, the shogun's men seemed to suspect that this was some sort of trick, and by midnight they had still made no move to leave. But during a lull in the rain near dawn, a corps of mounted men suddenly crossed the moat and fled from the capital. When Nabunaga was told that it was certain that Yoshiaki had escaped, he addressed his troops. The house is empty. There's not much benefit in attacking an empty house, but the shogunate that has lasted fourteen generations has brought about its own downfall. Attack and raise your victory cries. This will be the funeral service for the evil government of the Ashikaga shoguns. The Nijo palace was destroyed in one attack. Almost all the retainers in the palace surrendered. Even the two nobles, Hino and Takaka, came out and apologized to Nabunaga. But one man, Mibuchi Yamato, and more than sixty of his retainers fought to the very end without submitting. Not one of them fled and not one of them yielded. All were cut down in battle and died gloriously as samurai. Yoshiaki fled Kyoto and entrenched himself in Uji. Reckless as always, he had with him only a small defeated force. When, not long afterward, Nabunaga's troops closed in on his headquarters at the Bayadon Temple, Yoshiaki surrendered without a struggle. Everyone leave, Nabunaga ordered. Nabunaga sat a little straighter and looked directly at Yoshiaki. I suppose you've not forgotten that you once said you thought of me as your father. It was a happy day when you were sitting in the palace I had rebuilt for you. Yoshiaki was silent. Do you remember? Lord Nabunaga, I have not forgotten. Why are you talking of those days now? You're a coward, my lord. I'm not thinking of taking your life, even after things have come to this. Why are you still telling lies? Forgive me. I was wrong. I'm happy to hear it. But you certainly are in trouble even though you were born to the position of shogun. I want to die. Lord Nabunaga. I, won't you? Assist me in committing seppuku? Please stop. Nabunaga laughed. Excuse my rudeness, but I suspect you don't even know the proper way of cutting open your own stomach. I've never really felt inclined to hate you. It's just that you never stop playing with fire, and the sparks keep flying to other provinces. I understand now. Well, I think it might be better if you retired somewhere quietly. I'll keep your son and bring him up, so you won't need to worry about his future. Yoshiaki was released and told that he was free to go into exile. Guarded by Hideyoshi, Yoshiaki's son was taken to Waiki Castle. This arrangement was really a case of malice rewarded with favor, but Yoshiaki took it with his usual jaundiced view and could only feel that his son had been politely taken hostage. Miyoshi Yashitsugu was governor of Waiki Castle, and later Yoshiaki too found shelter with him. Not wanting to play host to a bothersome, defeated aristocrat, however, Yashitsugu soon made him feel uneasy, saying, I think you're going to be in danger if you stay here much longer. Nabunaga could change his mind at the slightest provocation and have your head cut off. 
Yoshiaki left in a hurry and went to Ki, where he tried to incite the warrior monks of Kumano and Saiga to rebel, promising them grandiose favors in return for striking Nobunaga down. Using the name and dignity of his office, he did nothing more than bring down upon himself the derision and laughter of the people. It was rumored that he did not stay long in Ki, but soon crossed into Bison and became a dependent of the Yukita clan. And with this, a new era started. It could be said that the destruction of the shogunate was a sudden opening in the thick clouds that had covered the sky. Now a small portion of blue could be seen. There is nothing more frightening than a period of aimless national government administered by rulers in name only. The samurai ruled in every province, protecting their privileges. The clergy acquired wealth and strengthened its authority. The nobles were changed to mice in the imperial court, one day relying on the warriors, the next employing the clergy, and then abusing the government for their own defense. Thus the empire was sundered into four nations the nation of priests, the nation of samurai, the nation of the court, and the nation of the shogunate each of which fought its private wars. The eyes of the people were opened wide at Nobunaga's actions. But even though they looked up at the deep blue sky, all the thick clouds had not yet dispersed. Nobody could guess what would happen next. During the past two or three years, several key men had passed away. Two years before both Mori Motonari, the lord of the largest domain in western Japan, and Hojo Ujiyasu, the master of eastern Japan, had died. But for Nobunaga these events did not carry nearly as great a significance as the death of Takeda Shinjin and the exile of Yoshiaki. 2. Nobunaga, it was especially the death of Shinjin who had constantly threatened him from the north that left him free to concentrate his strength in one direction, a direction that made more fighting and chaos almost inevitable. There was certainly no doubt that, after the demise of the shogunate, the warrior clans in every province would raise their banners and compete to be the first to enter the field. Nobunaga has burned down Mount High and overthrown the shogun. Such lawlessness must be punished. This would be their battle cry. Nobunaga knew that he would have to steal the initiative and defeat his rivals before they were able to form an alliance against him. Hideyoshi, you hurry back first. I'll probably come visit you at Yokoyama Castle soon. I'll be waiting for you. Hideyoshi seemed to have grasped the direction of events, and after accompanying Yoshiaki's son to Waiki, he quickly returned to his castle at Yokoyama. It was the end of the seventh month when Nobunaga returned to Gifu. At the beginning of the next month, an urgent letter written in Hideyoshi's own poor hand arrived M. Yokoyama. The opportunity is ripe. Let's move. In the lingering heat of the eighth month, Nobunaga's army left Yanagais and crossed into Ekizen. Opposing it was the army of Asakura Yashikij of Ikijagadani. At the end of the seventh month, Yashikij had received an urgent message from Odani, from Ase Hasamasa and his son, Nagamasa. His allies in northern Omi, the Oda army is coming north. Send reinforcements quickly. If help is slow in Kamayanji, we will be lost. There were those in the war councils who doubted that this could be true, but the Ase were allies, so ten thousand soldiers were hastily dispatched. And when this vanguard had marched as far as Mount Tegumi, they realized that the Oda attack was a fact. Once the reality was understood, a rear guard of more than twenty thousand men was sent. Asakura Yashikage considered the crisis grave enough to lead the army in person. Any fighting in northern Omi was obviously extremely alarming to the Asakura, because the Ase formed the first line of defense for their own province. Both the Ase father and son were at Odani Castle. About three leagues away stood Yokoyama Castle, in which Hideyoshi had entrenched himself, keeping watch on the Ase like a hawk for Nobunaga. By autumn, Nobunaga was already attacking the Ase. He struck Kinamoto in a surprise attack against the army of Ekizen. Over 2,800 heads were taken by the Oda. They pressed on against the enemy, now fleeing from Yanagais, running them down and blackening the dry early autumn grasses with blood. The Ekizen warriors lamented the weakness of their army. 
but the fierce generals and brave warriors who turned back to fight were struck down in battle. Why were they so weak? And why were they unable to strike at the Oda? In anyone's fall, there is an accumulation of factors, and natural collapse comes in an instant. But when this particular instant came, both ally and enemy wondered at its suddenness and magnitude. The rise and fall of provinces, however, are always based on natural phenomena, and here, too, there was really nothing miraculous or strange. The weakness of the Asakura could be understood simply by looking at the behavior of their commander-in-chief, Yashikage. Caught in the stampede of his men fleeing from Yanagais, Yashikage had already lost his head. It's all over. We can't even flee. Both my horse and I are exhausted. To the mountains, he cried. He had neither a plan for a counterattack nor any spirit left to fight. Thinking only of himself, he quickly abandoned his horse and tried to find a hiding place. What are you doing? Scolding him with tears in his eyes, his chief retainer, Takuma Mimasaka, pulled him back by his sash, forced him onto his horse, and pushed him off toward Ekizen. Then, standing his ground in order to give his lord time to escape, he took over a thousand soldiers and fought against the Oda army as long as he could. It is hardly necessary to say that Takuma and all his men died, suffering a wretched and complete annihilation. While such loyal retainers were being sacrificed, Jashikid shut himself up in his main castle at Ikijagadani. But he did not even have the spirit to put up a stubborn defense of the land of his ancestors. Soon after his return to the castle, he took his wife and children and fled to a temple in the Ono district. He reasoned that if they had been inside the castle, when worst came to worst, he would have had no escape route. With their lord demonstrating such a lack of resolve, all of his generals and soldiers deserted. Autumn was at its fullest. Nabunaga returned to his camp on Mount Torigos, from which point he had already surrounded Odani. From the time he arrived, he had seemed extraordinarily composed, as though he were simply waiting for the castle to fall. With the precipitous collapse of Ekizen, he had immediately returned while the ashes of Ikijagadani were still smoldering. Now he was giving out orders. Minami Yashitsugu, the surrendering general of Ekizen, was given to Ohara Castle. Similarly, Asakura Kajiki was commanded to defend Ino Castle, and Toda Yerokuro was ordered to the castle at Fuchu. Thus Nabunaga employed a large number of Asakura retainers who were familiar with the conditions of the province. Finally, Akechi Mitsuhide was left in charge as their overseer. In all likelihood there could not have been anyone better suited for this responsibility than Mitsuhide. During his unsettled days as a wanderer, he had been a retainer of the Asakura clan and lived in the castle town of Ikijagadani, suffering the cold glances of his colleagues. Now, in a completely reverse situation, he was keeping watch over his former masters. Considerable pride and a stream of other emotions must have passed through Mitsuhide's breast. Furthermore, Mitsuhide's intelligence and ability had been recognized on a number of occasions, and he was now one of Nabunaga's favorite retainers. In his observation of others, Mitsuhide was far more intelligent than most men and after a number of years of battles and daily service, he understood Nabunaga's character quite well. He knew his master's expressions, words, and looks even at a distance just as well as he did his own. Mitsuhide dispatched riders from Ekizen many times a day. He did not make even the smallest decision on his own, but asked for Nabunaga's instructions in every situation. Nabunaga made his decisions while looking at these notes and letters in his camp on Mount Torigos. Mountains in full autumn colors lined the cloudless blue sky, which in turn was reflected in the bright blue lake below. The chattering of birds invited a yawn here and here. Hideyoshi quickly crossed the mountains from Yokoyama. Joking with his men on the way, his teeth shone white as he laughed in the autumn sun. As he approached, he greeted everyone around him. This was the man who had built the castle at Sonomata and later had been put in charge of Yokoyama Castle. 
His responsibilities and position among the generals of the Oda army had very quickly become prominent, and yet he was he same as he had always been. When other generals compared his behavior with their own solemn ways, there were some who judged him to be frivolous and indiscreet, but others saw him in a different light. Saying, He's worthy of his rank. He hasn't changed from what he was before, even though his stipends increased. First he was a servant, then a samurai, and then suddenly he was governing a castle. But he's still the same. I imagine he's going to earn an even larger domain. Hideyoshi had just before then leisurely shown his face in camp before luring Nabunaga away with a few simple words, and they were both climbing up toward the mountains. How impertinent! Shibata Katsui exclaimed as he and Sakuma Nabumori went out beyond the barracks. That is why he's so disliked, even when he doesn't have to be. There's nothing more unpleasant than listening to someone who rattles on about his own cleverness. Almost spitting out their words, they watched the figure of Hideyoshi thread his way through the far-off marsh in the company of Nabunaga. He doesn't tell us anything doesn't consult with us at all. First of all, isn't that awfully dangerous? It may be broad daylight, but the enemy could be lurking anywhere in these mountains. What would happen if they started Shudainji at him? Well, his lordship is his lordship. No, it's Hideyoshi who's at fault. Even if a large crowd accompanies his lordship, Hideyoshi fawns all over him until he catches his eye. There were other commanders besides Katsui and Nabimori who were unhappy with the situation. Most of them assumed that Hideyoshi was off with Nabunaga in the mountains, planning some battle strategy with his usual glib tongue. This was the PRI Mary source of their discomfort. He's ignoring us the inner circle of his generals. Whether Hideyoshi did not understand such inner workings of human nature or simply chose to ignore them, he led Nabunaga off into the mountains occasionally laughing with a voice that would have been more fitting for a holiday excursion. With his and Nabunaga's retainers combined, their small force was made up of no more than twenty or thirty men. A man really sweats when he climbs mountains. Shall I give you a hand, my lord? Don't be insulting. It's just a little farther. I haven't climbed enough. Aren't there any mountains higher than this? Unfortunately, no, not in this area. But this is pretty high. Wiping the sweat from his face, Nabunaga looked down into the neighboring valleys. He saw that Hideyoshi's troops were hiding among the trees, standing guard. The men accompanying us should stay here. It wouldn't be good for us to go in a large group past this point. This said, Hideyoshi and Nabunaga walked thirty or forty paces the crest of the hill. There were no longer any trees. Tender grains and grasses that would have made good fodder stretched along the surface of the mountain. Chinese balloon flowers rustled among the pampas grass. Blooms of beggars' purse clung to the scabbards of their swords. The two of them advanced in silence. It was as though they were looking out to sea, with nothing before them. Stoop down, my lord. Like this? Hide yourself in the grass. As they crawled to the edge of the precipice, a castle appeared in the valley right beneath them. That's Odani, Hideyoshi said softly as he pointed toward the castle. Nabunaga nodded and looked on silently. His eyes were shrouded in some deep emotion. It was not simply that he was looking at the enemy's main castle. Inside this castle that was now besieged by his own army lived his younger sister, Oichi, who had already borne four children since becoming the wife of the castle's lord. Both lord and retainer sat down. The flowers and the ears of the autumn grasses came up to their shoulders. Nabunaga stared unblinkingly at the castle beneath them, and then turned toward Hideyoshi. I dare say my sister is angry with me. I was the one who married her into the Asai clan without even letting her speak her own mind. She was told to sacrifice herself for the good of the clan, and that the match was necessary to protect the province. Hideyoshi, I feel as though I can still see that scene today. I remember it well myself, Hideyoshi said. She had an enormous amount of baggage and a beautiful palanquin, 
and she was surrounded by attendants and decorated horses. It was a splendid event, the day she went off to be married north of Lake Biwa. Oichi was only an innocent girl of fourteen. She was such a small, pretty bride. Hideyoshi. Yes? You understand, don't you? How painful this is for me. For that very reason, it's hard for me too. Nabunaga motioned toward the castle with his chin. There is no difficulty in the decision to destroy this castle, but when I think about trying to get Oichi out of there without her getting hurt. When you ordered me to spy out the lay of the land around Odani Castle, I guessed that you were planning a campaign against the Asakura and the Ase. I probably sound as though I'm flattering myself again, but if you'll allow me to speak frankly, I think you're somewhat reserved about showing your natural feelings, and certainly the cause of your distress, my lord. It's rude of me to say this, but I think I've discovered one more of your eter qualities. You're the only one. Nabunaga clicked his tongue. Katsui, Nabimori, and the others look at me as though I've been wasting my time for the last ten days. Their faces show that they don't understand me at all. It seems that Katsui especially is laughing at me behind my back. That's because, my lord, you are still confused about which way to go. I can't help but be confused. If we were to pulverize the enemy bit by bit, there's no doubt that Ase Nagamasa and his father would drag Oichi down with them to the bottom of the flames. That's probably the way it would be. Hideyoshi, you say you've felt the same way I do from the very beginning but you're listening to this with extraordinary composure. Don't you have some sort of plan? I'm not without one. Well, why don't you hurry up and put my mind to rest? I've been doing my best not to make recommendations recently. Why? Because there are a lot of other people in the staff headquarters. Are you afraid of other people's jealousy? That's annoying, too. But the main thing is that I am the one who decides everything. Tell me your plan right away. Look over there, my lord. Hideyoshi pointed at Odani Castle. What makes this castle? Special is that the three enclosures are more distinct and independent than in most other castles. Lord Hisamasa lives in the first enclosure, and his son, Nagamasa, and Lady Oichi and her children live in the third. Over there? Yes, my lord. Now, the area you see between the first and third enclosures is called the Kayagaku enclosure, and that's where the senior retainers, Ase Jenba, Midamura Yumandeu, and Anaji Tosa are quartered. So, in order to capture Odani, rather than hitting the tail or striking the head, if we can first get our hands on the Kayagaku enclosure, the other two will be cut off. I see. You're saying that our next move is to attack the Kayagaku. No, if we storm the Kayagaku, the first and third enclosures will send reinforcements. Our men will be attacked on both flanks, and a fierce battle will ensue. In that case, would we try to break our way through or retreat? Either way, we cannot be sure of Lady Oichi's fate inside the castle. So what should we do? Of course, it's clear that the very best strategy would be to send a messenger to the Ase explain the advantages and disadvantages of the situation clearly, and take Posse's shown of both the castle and Oichi without incident. You should know that I've already tried that twice. I sent a messenger to the castle and informed them that if they surrendered, I would allow them to keep their domains. I made sure that they knew that Ekizen had been conquered, but neither Nagamasa nor his father is going to budge. They're only going to show off how tough they are just like before. Their toughness, of course, is nothing more than using Oichi's life as a shield. They think that I'll never make a reckless attack as long as they have my own sister in the castle. But it's not just that. For the two years I've been at Yokoyama, I've been watching Nagamasa carefully, and he does have some talent and willpower. Well, I've been trying to think of a plan to capture this castle for a long time, to figure out the best strategy in case we ever had to attack it. I have captured the Kayagaku enclosure without losing a single man. What? What are you saying? Nabunaga doubted his own ears. 
The second enclosure you see over there. Our men are already in control of it, Hideyoshi repeated. So I'm saying you don't have to worry anymore. Is this true? Would I lie to you at a time like this, my lord? But I can't believe it. That's understandable, but you'll be able to hear it with your own ears soon, from two men I've summoned. Would you meet with them? Who are they? One is a monk called Maib Sensho. The other is Anaji Tosa, the commander of the enclosure. Nabunaga could not rid himself of his surprised expression. He believed Hideyoshi, but he could not help wondering how he had persuaded a senior retainer of the Ase clan come over to their side. Hideyoshi explained the situation as though there were nothing unusual about it at all. Shortly after your lordship awarded me the castle at Yokoyama, he started. Nabunaga was a little startled. He was unable to look without blinking at the man who was speaking. Yokoyama Castle was situated on the front line of this strategic area, and Hideyoshi's troops were there to check the Ase and Asakura. He remembered the order posting Hideyoshi there temporarily, but he had no memory of a promise to give him the castle. But here was Hideyoshi saying that he had been given the castle. Nabunaga, however, put this in the back of his mind for the moment. Wasn't that the year right after the attack on Mount High, when you came to Gifford to make a New Year's call? Nabunaga asked. That's right. On the way back, Takanaka Hanbei fell ill and we were delayed. By the time we arrived at Yokoyama Castle, it was after dark. I don't feel like listening to a long story. Get to the point. The enemy had found out that I was away from the castle and was making a night attack. We repulsed them, of course, and at the time we captured the monk Maib Zensho. You took him alive? Yes. Rather than cutting off his head we treated him kindly, and later, when I had a moment, I counseled him about the coming times and instructed him in the true significance of being a samurai. He, in turn, talked to his former master, Anaji Tosa, and persuaded him to surrender to us. Really? The battlefield is no place for jokes, Hideyoshi said. Lost in admiration, even Nabunaga was amazed at Hideyoshi's cunning. The battlefield is no place for jokes. And just as he had bragged, Maib Zensho and Anaji Tosa were led in by Hideyoshi's retainer for an audience with Nabunaga. He questioned Tosa closely to confirm Hideyoshi's story. The general responded clearly. This surrender is not at my own discretion. The other two senior retainers stationed in the Kyogaku have realized that opposing you is not only foolish, but it would also hasten the fall of the clan and impose needless suffering on the people of the province. Nagamasa was under thirty, but he already had four children by the Lady Oichi, who herself was twenty-three. He occupied the third enclosure of Odani Castle, which was really three castles in one. Gunfire could be heard from the ravine to the south until the evening. The report of cannons sounded periodically, and each time the fretwork ceiling shook as if it were going to come loose. Oichi looked up instinctively with frightened eyes and held a baby more tightly against her breast. The child was as yet unweaned. There was no wind, but soot was blowing everywhere, and the light of the lamp flickered wildly. Mother! I'm scared! Her second daughter, Hatsu, clung to her right sleeve while her eldest daughter, Cha-Cha, silently held fast to her left knee. Her son, however, did not come to his mother's lap even though he was still small. He was brandishing an arrow shaft at a lady-in-waiting. This was Nagamasa's heir, Manjumaru. Let me see! Let me see the battle! Manju cried petulantly, striking the lady-in-wait Tianji with the headless arrow. Manju, his mother reproved him. Why are you hitting her? Your father is fighting. Have you already forgotten that he told you to behave during the fighting? If you are laughed at by the retainers, you won't become a good general even when you grow up. Manju was old enough to understand a little of his mother's reasoning. He listened to her silently for a moment, but then suddenly began to cry out loud fretfully. I want to see the battle. 
I want to see. The child's tutor did not know what to do either, and simply stood there watching. Just then there was a lull in the fighting, but gunfire could still be heard. The eldest girl, Cha-Cha, was already seven years old, and she somehow understood the difficult circumstances her father was in, her mother's sorrow, and even the feelings of the warriors in the castle. She said precociously, Manju, don't say things that upset mother. Don't you think this is horrible for her? Father's out there fighting the enemy. Isn't that right, mother? Taken to task, Manju looked at his sister and jumped on her, still brandishing the arrow shaft. You stupid cha-cha, he shouted. Cha-cha put her sleeve over her head and hid behind her mother. Be good now. Trying to humor him, Oichi took the arrow shaft and talked to him quietly. Suddenly there was the sound of violent footsteps in the entrance hall outside. What's that? To the likes of the Oda? They're nothing but little samurai who have pushed their way from the backwoods of Oari. Do you think I'm going to surrender to a man like Nobunaga? The Ase clan is in a different class from them. Ase Nagamasa entered unannounced, followed by two or three generals. When he saw that his wife was out of harm's way in this cavernous, poorly lit room, he was relieved. I'm a little tired, he said, sitting down and loosening the cords on a SEC tie-in of his armor. Then he said to the generals behind him, With the way things are going this evening, the enemy may well make an all-out attack around midnight. We'd better rest now. When the commanders got up to leave, Nagamasa heaved a sigh of relief. Even in the midst of battle, he was able to remember that he was both a father and a husband. Was the sound of the guns this evening frightening, my dear? He asked his wife. Surrounded by her children, Waichi replied, No, we were in here, so it was all right. Didn't Manju or Cha-Cha get scared and cry? You should be proud of them. They acted like adults. Really? He said, forcing a smile. Then he continued, Don't worry. The Oda made a fierce attack, but we pushed them back with a volley from the castle. Even if they continue attacking us for twenty or thirty, or even one hundred days, we'll never surrender. We are the Ase clan. We're not going to yield to someone like Nobunaga. He railed against the Oda almost as though he could spit, but then suddenly fell silent. With the light of the lamp behind her, Oichi's face was buried in the child suckling at her breast. This was Nabunaga's little sister. Nagamasa shook with emotion. She even looked like him. She had her brother's delicate complexion and his profile. Are you crying? The baby sometimes gets fretful and chews my nipple when the milk doesn't come out. The milk isn't coming out? No, not now. That's because you have some unseen sorrow and you're getting too thin. But you are a mother, and this is a mother's true battle. I know. I suspect you think I'm a hard husband. She edged up to her husband's side, still holding the child to her breast. No, I don't. Why should I bear a grudge? I look at it all as fate. People can't be reconciled just by saying that it's fate. The life of a samurai's wife is more painful than swallowing swords. If you are not completely resolved, it won't be a resolution at all. I'm trying to come to that kind of an understanding, but all I can think of is that I'm a mother. My dear, even on the day I married you, I didn't think that you would be mine forever. Neither did my father give his permission for you to become a true bride of the Ase. What? What are you saying? At a time like this, a man has to tell the truth. This moment will never come again so I'm going to open my heart to you. When Nabunaga sent you to marry me, it was really nothing more than a political stratagem. I could see through to what was in his heart from the very first. He paused. But even while I knew that, a love grew between us that nothing could ever stop. Then we had four children. At this point you are no longer Nobuaga's sister. You're my wife and the mother of my children. I won't allow you to shed tears for our enemy. 
So why are you growing so thin and holding back the milk you should be giving to our child? Now she could see. Everything that had been a result of fate had been conceived as political stratagem. She was a bride of political strategy. From the very first Nagamasa had seen Nabunaga as someone to watch. But Nabunaga had sincerely loved his brother-in-law. Nabunaga believed that the heir of the Ase clan had a future, and he had trusted him. He had pushed for the marriage enthusiastically. But the match had been in doubt from the very beginning, because of the much older alliance between the Ase and the Asakura of Ekizen. Their pact was not simply one of mutual defense, but a complex relationship based on friendship and mutual favors. The Asakura and Oda had been in Mai's for years. When Nabunaga had attacked the Saito and Gifu, how much had they hindered him and come to the aid of the Saito? Nabunaga overcame this obstacle to the match by sending a written pledge to the Asakura, promising not to invade their domain. Soon after the wedding, both Nagamasa's father and the Asakura clan to which he owed so many favors began to pressure Nagamasa to regard his wife with suspicion. In the meantime, the Ase had joined the Asakura, the Shogun, Takeda's Shinjen of Kai, and the warrior monks of Mount Hai in an anti-Nabunaga alliance. The following year Nabunaga had invaded Ekizen. Suddenly he was struck from behind. Cutting off Nabunaga's path of retreat and acting in concert with the Asakura clan, Nagamasa had plotted the man's utter annihilation. At the time, Nagamasa made it clear to Nabunaga that he was not going to let his judgment be affected by his wife, but Nabunaga would not believe it. The forces of the Ase and the martial valor of the man whom Nabunaga had trusted had become a fire at his very feet. Indeed, they had become chains. After the destruction of Ekizen, however, Odani Castle was no longer either a fire or constricting chains. Nevertheless, at this time Nabunaga was still hopeful that he would not have to kill Nagamasa. Of course, he respected Nagamasa's courage, but more than that, he was troubled with his affection for Oichi. People thought this strange, remembering that, when he had destroyed Mount Hai with fire, this lord had thought nothing of being called the king of the demons. Autumn deepened day by day. At dawn, the dew on the grass around the castle was wet and cold. My lord, something terrible has happened. Fujikak Mikawa's voice was unusually perturbed. Nagamasa had slept that night near the mosquito netting that protected his wife and children, but he had not taken off his armor. What is it, Mikawa? He quickly left the bedroom, breathing heavily. A dawn attack. That was his first thought but the disaster that Mikawa was reporting was worse than that. The Kayabaku enclosure was taken by the Oda during the night. What? There's no doubt. You can see it from the keep, my lord. It can't be. He climbed quickly to the watchtower, stumbling many times on the dark stairs. Although the Kayabaku was far away from the watchtower, the enclosure looked as if it were just below him. There, fluttering at the top of the castle in the distance, were a great number of banners, but not one of them belonged to the Ase. One of the commander's standards, flying brilliantly and proudly in the wind, quite clearly evidenced the presence of Hideyoshi. We've been betrayed! Fine. I'll show them. I'll show Nabunaga and all the samurai in this country, he said, forcing a smile. I'll show them how Ase Nagamasa dies. Nagamasa descended the darkened stairway of the watchtower. For the retainers who followed him, it was like accompanying their lord deep beneath the surface of the earth. What what's going on? lamented one of the generals, halfway down the staircase. Anaji Tosa, Ase Jenba, and Mitamura Yuman have gone over to the enemy. One general answered. Another man said bitterly. Even though they were senior retainers, they betrayed the trust placed in them when they were put in charge of the Kayabaku. They're inhuman, Nagamasa turned around and said. Stop complaining. They stood in the wide, wooden-floored room at the bottom of the stairs, which was brightened by a faint light. The fortified room resembled a huge cage or jail cell. 
Many of the wounded had been brought here, and they lay on straw mats, groaning. When Nagamasa passed through, even the samurai who were lying down made an effort to kneel. I won't let them die in vain! I won't let them die in vain! Nagamasa said with tears in his eyes as he passed through. Yet he turned again to his generals and strictly forbade them to complain. There is no use in insulting others. Each of you must pick your own course whether you surrender to the enemy or die with me. There's moral duty on both sides. Nabunaga is fighting to rebuild the nation. I'm fighting for the name and honor of the samurai class. If you think you had better submit to Nabunaga, then go to him. I'm certainly not going to stop you. So saying, he walked out to check the defenses of the castle, but he had not taken a hundred paces when something much more serious than losing Kayagaku was reported to him. My lord! My lord! Terrible news! One of his officers, drenched in blood, came running toward him and dropped to his knees. What is it, Kyutaro? A premonition that something was very wrong settled quickly in Nagamasa's breast. Wakui Kyutaro was not a samurai stationed in the third enclosure. He was a retainer of Nagamasa's father. Your honored father, Lord Hisamasa, has just committed seppuku. I cut my way here through the enemy to bring you this. Kyutaro dropped to his knees. Gasping, he took out Hisamasa's topknot and the silk kimono it was wrapped in and put them into Nagamasa's hand. What? The first enclosure has also fallen? Just before dawn, a corps of soldiers took the secret path from Kayagaku to just outside the castle gate, flying Anaji's standard, saying that Anaji urgently needed to see Lord Hisamasa. Assuming that Anaji was leading his own men, the guards opened the gate. As soon as that happened, a large force of soldiers rushed in and cut their way through to the inner citadel. The enemy? The greater part of them were Lord Hideyoshi's retainers, but the men who showed him the way were undoubtedly the retainers of that traitor Anaji. Well, what about my father? He fought gallantly to the very end. He himself set fire to the inner citadel and then committed suicide, but the enemy put out the fire and occupied the castle. Ah, so that's why we didn't see any flames or smoke. If flames had been rising from the first enclosure, then you would have sent reinforcements. Or you might have set fire to this castle and committed suicide with your wife and children when your father perished. I think this is what the enemy feared and planned against. Suddenly, Kutaro dug his nails into the ground and said, My lord, I am dying. With his palms pressed down in obeisance, his head dropped to the floor. He had fought and won a far more bitter battle than on the field. Another brave soul gone. Someone lamented behind Negamasa, and then softly intoned a prayer. The sound of prayer beads clicked in the silence. When Nagamasa turned, he saw that it was the head priest, Yuzan another refugee from the war. I was sorry to hear that Lord Hisamasa met his end early this morning, Yuzan said. Your reverence, I have a request, Nagamasa said in a steady voice. His words were calm, but there was no concealing their plaintive tone. It will be my turn next. I would like to gather all of my retainers together and hold a funeral service, at least in form, while I am still alive. In the valley behind Odani, there is a memorial stone carved with the Buddhist death name you yourself gave me. Would you please have the stone moved inside the castle? You're a priest, and surely the enemy would let you through. Of course. Yuzan left immediately. As he did so, one of Nagamasa's generals nearly ran into him as he hurried in. Fuwa Mitsuhara has come to the castle gate. Who is he? A retainer of Lord Nabunaga. The enemy? Nagamasa spat. Chase him away. I don't have any use for Nabunaga's retainers. If he won't go away, feed him some rocks from the castle gate. The samurai obeyed Nagamasa's command and dashed off immediately, but soon another commander arrived. The messenger from the enemy is still standing at the castle gate. He won't leave, no matter what we say. He protests that war is war, 
and negotiations are negotiations, and asks why we lack the proper etiquette toward him as a representative of his province. Nagamasa ignored these complaints, and then berated the man who had repeated them. Why are you explaining the protests of a man I told you to chase off? Just then, yet another general came forward. My lord, the rules of war dictate that you should meet with him, even for just a moment. I would not have it said that Ase Nagamasa was so distracted that he lost his composure and refused to grant an audience to an enemy envo. All right, let him in. I'll see him, at least. Over there, Nagamasa said, pointing to the guard room. More than half of the soldiers in the castle of the Ase hoped that peace was walking in through the gate. It was not that they lacked admiration or devotion for Nagamasa, but the duty that Nagamasa preached and the reasons for this war were entwined with his relationship with Ekizen and his resentment of Nabunaga's ambitions and achievements. The soldiers understood this contrast only too well. And there was more. Although Odani Castle had held out steadfastly until then, both the first and second enclosures had already fallen. What chance of victory did they have? entrenched in an isolated and desolate castle. Thus, the arrival of the Oda envoy was like the clear blue sky they had been waiting for. Fua entered the castle, went into the room where Nagamasa awaited him, and knelt in front of him. The men inside fixed Fua with hostile stares. Their hair was disheveled, and they had wounds on their hands and heads. The kneeling Fua spoke so gently that one might have doubted that he was a general at all. I have the honor of being Lord Nabunaga's envo. Formal greetings are not necessary on the battlefield. Let's get to the point, Nagamasa said peremptorily. Lord Nabunaga admires your loyalty to the Asakura clan, but today, the Asakura have already fallen, and their ally, the Shogun, is in exile. Both favors and grudges are now far in the past, so why should the Oda and Ase clans be fighting? Not only that, but Lord Nabunaga is your brother-in-law. You are the beloved husband of his sister. I've heard this all before. If you're asking for a peace treaty, I absolutely refuse. It won't make any difference how persuasive you are. With all due respect, there's nothing left for you to do but to capitulate. Your behavior so far has been exemplary. Why not give up the castle like a man and work for your clan's future? If you agree, Lord Nabunaga is willing to give you the entire province of Yamato. Nagamasa let out a scornful laugh. He waited until the envoy had finished. Please tell Lord Nabunaga that I am not going to be fooled by such clever words. What he is really concerned about is his sister, not me. That's a cynical view. Say whatever you like, he hissed but go back and tell him that I'm not considering saving myself through my ties with my wife. And you had better tell Nabunaga to persuade himself of the fact that Oichi is my wife and no longer his sister. Well then, I take it you plan to share the fate of this castle, no matter what? I'm resolved on that not only for myself but for my wife, too. Then there's nothing more to be said. With that fewer returned directly to Nabunaga's camp. After that, Hopelessness or, more properly, emptiness filled the castle with gloom. Soldiers who had expected peace from the Oda messenger could only assume that the talks had broken down. They were now openly despondent, because they had briefly hoped that their lives would be spared. There was another reason for gloom to settle on the castle. Although there was a battle going on, the funeral for Nagamasa's father was taking place and voices intoning the sutras drifted out from the interior of the keep until the following day. Oichi and her four children wore white silk garments of mourning from that day on. The cords that held up their hair were black. They seemed to possess a purity that was not. Of this world, even though they were yet alive, and even those retainers who were resolved to die in the castle quite naturally felt their fate was too pitiful for words. Yuzan now returned to the castle, accompanied by workmen carrying the stone monument. Just before dawn, incense and flowers were placed in the main hall of the castle for the funeral service for the living. Yuzan addressed the assembly of the Ase clan's retainers. Valuing his name as a member of the samurai class, 
Lord Ase Nagamasa, the master of this castle, has passed away like a beautiful fallen flower. Therefore, as his retainers it is proper for you to pay your last respects. Nagamasa sat behind the stone monument as though he had really died. At the beginning, the samurai looked as though they did not understand. They asked themselves if all this was necessary and fidgeted in the strange atmosphere. But Oichi and the children and other members of the family knelt in front of the monument and put incense into the burner. Someone began to weep, and soon everyone was affected. Filling the broad room, the armored men hung their heads and averted their eyes. Not one of them could look up. When the ceremony was over, Yuzan took the lead, and several samurai shouldered the monument and carried it out of the castle. This time they went down to Lake Biwa, took a small boat, and at a place about one hundred yards from Chikabu Island, sunk the stone to the bottom. Nagamasa spoke fearlessly, facing the death that pressed in on him, and he had not overlooked the laxity of the martial spirit of those soldiers who had put their hopes on peace talks. His funeral for the living had a salutary effect on the faltering morale of the defenders. If their lord was resolved to die in battle, they too were resolved to follow him. It was time to die. Nagamasa's pathetic determination thus inspired his retainers. But although he was a gifted general, he was not a genius. Nagamasa did not know how to make his men die gladly for him. They stood, waiting for the final assault.